to disclose, Marie and I have known each other for a very long time, fellow museum educators at um, the Whitney Museum. So um, it looks like uh, we have people coming uh, in from all over um, uh, the country and also in London and Ohio, New York, et cetera, um, and which is great. So um, I'm going to start with you, Swa. Gold Needles um, exhibits some of the traditional uh, embroidery and textile art of Korea. Um, and many objects on view were created by anonymous women artists and really sort of uh, vividly, you know, vividly because of the huge, amazing color and artistry, present women's creativity. Um, uh, what does the exhibition reveal about this work, especially in relation to social roles of gender? Uh, so this exhibition uh, reveals how Korean uh, artists in the late 18th and 19th century uh, used embroidery as a tool of uh, empowerment to define who they are, also to strengthen their community. Also, it highlights uh, their artistic practice uh, truly cross uh, gender and professional barrier, uh, building the rich language of a Korean uh, embroidery art. So here we have like an installation shot. I believe that shows um, the two sort of spaces that um, that the uh, exhibition really occupies. Right. So there's one gallery that's on the left in this image that's dedicated to sort of primarily women's arts, or or art made by women on the right, um, art made by sort of um, male, right, embroiderers. Um, mm -hmm. so what, what impact do these gender constructs have on the story of Korean art as it's told? Um, and how did you challenge these sort of gender constructs in your curatorial choices? That's an excellent question. Uh, let's go back to the image, to the separate gallery chart. Um, uh, the concept of uh, really using a uh, two different gallery, uh, that one is textile gallery and the other one is a uh, Korean gallery, uh, uh, reflects the extremely gendered society during the Joseon period. Uh, textile gallery uh, represent women and private and their confined space, and a Korean gallery uh, represent male and public space. So, but however, the selection uh, of, of, of works of art for each gallery actually change that dichotomy and then highlight the fluidity of a social roles of genders. Uh, so you will see that in the, in the exhibition. Excellent. And there's, um, I think, a particular sort of uh, screen that's in one of the one of the galleries that you wanted to sort of turn to. I think that really sort of demonstrates this. Um, I think this mm -hmm. the hundred boys screen. If I'm correct. Right. Right. Uh, are we looking at that screen right now? Because uh, what I'm seeing is a roof, wedding gown. Uh, I believe it is up. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, this is a detailed view of the 100 uh, uh, children at play, and this uh, screen is in the installed in the uh, textile gallery. Uh, so what I've tried to do is, um, you know, the like European and American elite male, you know, view that uh, also the elite male view dictate overall interpretation and uh, also the um, in overall Korean art. History. So, really, in this exhibition, I will challenge. I challenge to challenge such a, a problematic uh, viewpoint. Also, uh, um, highlight the tension that existing uh, between two different, uh, uh, the you know, gender gender differences. Also, the tension among the members of uh, various uh, social economic classes. And th these two ideas uh, really fuel my. Uh, uh, curatorial direction, and this particular piece really highlights that direction that I took for the exhibition. The subject of this folding screen is 100 children at play, and usually this type of subjects uh, uh, is treated as an auspicious symbol of prosperity, happiness, but I didn't want to really provide such a cliche interpretation uh, in this exhibition, and uh, my interpretation uh, label really also provides the high uh, 
you know, mortality level uh, among women mm -hmm. who uh, died in the process of giving a birth. And uh, also the pointing out that such a, um, a world view is really the patriarchal utopian view of the world is suppressing women and uh, women's rights. Uh, but at the same time, I didn't want to demonize all men in, uh, you know, who live in at that time in Korea. And at the same time, I provided 18th century letter of the father uh, to uh, his uh, you know, loving daughter who died actually in the, uh, in the labor. He wrote a beautiful letter that how he missed her, how he cherished her. So uh, I wanted to really embrace a multiple perspective as possible uh, you know, as I create this exhibition. No, thank, thank you. Thank you, Swat. So it's a really um, remarkable. I think some people are commenting on, you know, um, how the, the work is really quite stunning. Uh, also, quickly, I um, I think people are experiencing some technical difficulties. I think we're in a better place now, so uh, apologize for that. Um, now, I'd like to turn to you, Maria. Um, the Korean-American woman and artist, do you some some of Swa's sort of reflections and kind of curatorial choices on these um, artistic traditions sort of like match your own experiences or are some of these objects sort of familiar to you? I mean, first of all, I wish I was there to see it in person. It looks stunning from here. And also I grew up looking at these objects um, from my early young childhood. I mean, for example, there, I think I remember if we could see thimbles in um, the patchwork called Pojagi on the left, that's meant to be for gift shop. I mean, not gift shop, gift wrapping. So um, it's interesting to see that. And Sua, as you're talking about 100 um, boys, the foldable screen, I'm beginning to wonder that the girls, female artisans participated in making that screen, the embroider work. So um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That folding screen is uh, is uh, usually um, you know discussed as the product of male embroiderers, and uh, but you know because these male embroiderers work in the professional workshop, but you know in reality uh, they had to learn the you know techniques from mm -hmm. female embroiderers. So uh, in the reality, they actually worked hand in hand in a professional workshop, but in a professional world, women cannot you know, express themselves or this is the place I work that's not uh, kind of allowed in the traditional society then. So, but I really assume that there is also women workers uh, in broader work together to produce right. that uh, for blue screen. So looking at the thimbles, I mean, look at how small and delicate those um, designs are, right? They're meant to be, you know, be protective, um, protect your thumbs and fingers from mm -hmm. stitching. And then that though, that patchwork on the left, I mean, it's just so st stunning. It's mesmerizing, and I'm I'm also thinking if female artisans were given bigger space to be more creative, what kind of wow. you know art could have seen, and with that you know perception of our history and culture would have changed a little bit or not? Because I'm thinking about mm -hmm. my voices, my creativity as a performance artist. You know, I, yeah, I wear my traditional Korean garb, but I didn't want to just stop there in New York City where I'm based out of, but I wanted to go to all 50 states to carry a, a bigger dialogue and conversation with my fellow Americans. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And actually that, that brings us to, I think this great, great, uh, sort of, yeah, entree into your work, Maria, um, where you've, we spent nine years, right, performing as Maria, the Korean bride, adapting some of those cultural behaviors and stuff that's actually, we'll get to a little bit later, that's on view in the exhibition, a traditional uh, dress. Um, like, why did you adopt this persona? Um, maybe you're already giving us a, a sense of why you wanted to travel across the country, right? To sort of um, sort of break those boundaries, right? Um, but but how, how did this all start? Like, why this dress, why this performance? What did or does it mean to you? Growing up, I mean, my especially my dad, we had so many differences, and um, he would always remind me. One thing we did agree on um, is he said, don't forget, you're always going to look Korean. You may be Korean-American, but you're always going to look Korean, so do your part. And um, But it, my mother was the smarter one because she gave me this gift. And by the way, thanks to the Cleveland Museum of the Art, 
I am able to revisit this piece that I began 20 years ago. So I'm 20 years young. <laughs> anyway, so having said that, um, she gave me this gift, traditional Korean garb. Listen, I mean, this gift is not lightly looked upon. No, it's not everyday birthday gift here. And for her to give me this gift and saying, use it for fancy parties. It just, that mm. pressure was too big and massive. I had to wear them. Mm. I had to, I couldn't wait for fancy parties to be invited. No, well, I had to physically wear them, go and see what happened. And at the time, my friend wanted to go to um, Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada. And as we know, Las Vegas is, I like to think it's the capital of wedding capital of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there I went and I met, um, I met this beautiful Crystal Woods, also known as Tyna Ross impersonator. It's supposedly the longest show still happening in Vegas. Originally it was called the Lacage. I think it's called the mm -hmm. um, Divine. It's changed its name a little bit. And she is um, still in Vegas, and here I had a chance to marry her. But she's actually my second marriage in Las Vegas. I married um, Eddie, who is a restaurant um, waiter. And yeah, and we here we are driving, you know, through Wedding Chapel. So um, <laughs> yeah, and after getting married twice, it did something to me, besides the fact my ego was boosted. <laughs> I the multiple <laughs> weddings. It was interesting. It was fascinating. And here I am getting to know them and asking them, what do you guys do here? You know, besides going to Vegas shows or eating at a five star restaurant. And we all know who officiated my wedding. You recognize the gentleman on the right? Mm -hmm. Elvis Presley. Elvis. <laughs> naturally naturally. So so this really took you, right? So this sort of sparked it, this idea of like just having those two marriages in Nevada, which seems like an appropriate place to get married within a span of a vacation, um, or it's the only place where you can probably do that. So as you continue the project, right, to other states, um, how did you select whom to marry? Like, what was the courtship process? And I think we're gonna look at some images from Alaska and Hawaii as we, uh, as, as you discuss this. I mean, look at the community. Oh, um, I mean, basically most, every state's different, but most of the states I wanted to meet the locals and where do locals hang out when they're not at home at work? It's at their local bar, right? And I like to think bartenders, they know all your dark hidden secret. They're like almost like your therapist. And so there was some drinking involved, but in the case of Las Absolutely. Vegas, Las Vegas, I mean, Alaska, I mean, look at them. Um, it was already prearranged uh, because yeah, it was just so far to get there from New York City it was all prearranged and you could see he's a, he was a rookie Iditarod and that's what mm -hmm. I wanted to marry. That's what I wanted to embrace. I think next slide um, is an image of, um, yeah. I mean, look at that boy just mesmerized looking at us and it's the contract, exact contrast of this is Hawaii. And again, community uh -huh. involvement, everyone's there cheering for us and look at Spam. His name is Spam, like can of meat Spam. And um, which has, I know, which I, has I, an association, which has a Korean a cultural association too, do you, right? Or did? It does. Sue, mm -hmm. I think you mentioned the other day, it's not just me and my household. You probably ate it too. Oh, yeah. We, we put spams in every soup and especially kimchi, you know, jjigae, kimchi soup. We, we, one of the staple items. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, but no, anyway, so, so I'm starting to look at, and I wanted to embrace each individual states, what they're known for, and to get to know America a little bit more from, from local, you know, perspective. Yeah, and I, th I think that brings us to, to to thinking about this idea of of, of communities, right? Um, that the reactions that you receive, right, these across the country. Uh, here we're looking at some images from South Dakota and Wyoming. So. Yeah, you know, what reactions did you have, and what did that sort of reveal to you about these different places, or, or about marriage, or about even gender constructs? If that's you want to go there. So wait. Um. By the way, this is Paul, uh, my groom, my spouse, Paul, um, wearing that black jacket. He just got married 
So he just tied the knot. So congratulations to Paul. Um, yeah, I mean, again, the community involved is so essential. I, I mean, if there's a next picture, you could see they welcome me with the wedding reception, with the cake. Yes, it was official wedding mm -hmm. like this. You know, I had groomsmen, I had bridesmaid, and you know, real for real, he's a wedding official. And look at that cake. It may not be the prettiest, but the meaning is so thoughtful. Maria and yeah. Paul finally get with the cowboy hat. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that's what I always um, go back to. You know, those are the fond memories, but not every single images are as pretty and delicious looking as this. I mean, the next slide, I think I may be making a toast um, at a reception. I don't know if we could see the next slide. Yeah, Wyoming. Yeah, yeah Wyoming. And here I married a um, fifth generation cowboy. Yeah, I, I have to confess, I'm going to let all of you know who's joining us right now. <laughs> I did have a little crush on him. <laughs> um, and yeah, he is married. Yes, all of them got married and they have children. He's got two kids now. And here we are making a toast. And, you know, it's a celebratory. It's celebration and having a conversation, getting to know one another. I wish every state was like this, but that was not the case, especially yeah, yeah. in... I don't know which picture we have next. This is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Believe me, I am a fan of Wisconsin, please. But this is the state where everything kind of had mm -hmm. twists and turns and challenges. Why yeah. am I saying that? I mean, what is Wisconsin known for? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? For me, it's the cheese, um, Harley mm -hmm. Davidson, and also Miller Brewery. And I went on a drinking route since I've been doing that already since this project started. Um, I had gotten permission to get married on the premise, and well, but the manager on duty questioned my U.S. citizenship. And because they questioned my U.S. citizenship, it kind of put me in a different alert um, that I had never thought about. Here I am dressed yeah. in my Korean garb like that, going through the brewery on a tour and trying to scout out my groom. And the weekend manager kind of like prevented me because of mm. that pure hatred. I don't know. I really don't know. But I'm um, looking at it now. I am so grateful and thankful it, I did experience that because I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to go home empty handed. So what did I do? I went to a gift shop and decided to buy machine embroider. Miller Glory <laughs> shirt. And back then it was $50. I think $50 is still a lot of money. And that's what I did here. And to think about symbolic marriage, what does that mean to marry symbolically, yeah. right? And I could yes. tell you one thing, Sua, you would be surprised. It just occurred to me last night as I was getting prepared for this talk that in Vegas, last time I checked, Las Vegas, symbolic wedding is the hottest wedding to have. It's in demand and less really? divorce rate, right? Yeah, people are doing it. Wow. Wow, so it's interesting. Like you, So you came at this because of that um, right, xenophobic, racist experience. So you kind of came to a creative solution. In this case, that really makes it really apparent, right? You're not, at, you're outside the Miller Brewery. You're not allowed inside. You have this avatar of a person, right? And I'm using that word a lot, but it's true. Like you have the symbol of a person he's missing, right? So it kind of reflects on sort of like your alienation, um, your, you know, the exclusion that you experienced, but you continued, right, to marry um, non-human things, right? Uh, which I, or, you know, which I think is a really interesting solution. Like we have you doing this in Vermont, right? Where you're marrying a maple tree. Um, Another thing is, and there's a the wonderful documentary that Maria made, which is really thirteen. There's a link down that to that below. All of you are welcome to see it, one viewing only, but please watch it. It's great. When I was watching that documentary recently, I really realized how much that the background political issue, right, to your project was marriage equality, right, which is only guaranteed in 2015 by the Supreme Court. So. Um, could you talk about this experience in Vermont and how that sort of folds into these sort of marriage equality um, issue, right? And whether that was like an intentional thing you were thinking about. I mean, it's, I mean, everything, like I said in the beginning in Las Vegas, I had no idea. I knew I had to wear this Korean garb my mother gifted me with 
So I did something about that. And then after, when I got to Wisconsin, I decided to marry symbolic icons, images, popular things that represent each state. Vermont, for me, it's the maple tree, right? So here I had an opportunity. Everything was great. There was a couple, older couple that looked like classic, you know, American Gothic, you know, couple from the painting I'm talking about. And they even fed me lunch. It was a lovely experience until after the fact I had sent them a mini episode DVD to let them know, you know, that I had also had an opportunity to marry a lesbian because 2003, Massachusetts was the first state to legalize same-sex marriage. That's when everything fell apart. They did not, the couple who helped me to marry this beautiful Vermont maple tree did not agree with me. No, no, no. And, and that that conversation, it escalated something in my mind. You know, normally lesbians, gay people, anybody, I interview them, their um, relationship status, and they stay together average of 10 to, you know, 15 years. And yet, they love each other they cannot be married or they're not recognized by the government the state said it just it um it was heartbreaking for me to see that so it carried another conversation that i didn't anticipate so um that came into play and i love challenges like this you know rituals uh -huh. challenges you know that's what keeps me going it creates a deeper dialogue right and that's what we're doing here today Um, so what, did you have a, I think you wanted, there was something about objects that you wanted, that were, you were interested in, I think, exploring, um, with Yeah, Maria's let's work. move to the, the bridal gown image. Great. Uh, so Great. Maria, you were, you're wearing the traditional Korean uh, dress hanbok as a uh, wedding gown uh, throughout your project that we are revisiting. And uh, here I have uh, displayed this uh, wedding gown called Har Harot that the museum acquired in uh, 1915 in Seoul. And I'd like to hear your observation and your thought about uh, this gown. Well, I mean, my outfit, when I was wearing that, it evolved, it changed. You notice some are purple, some are bluish, mm -hmm. but this one is the ultimate outer, outer layer you're supposed to wear on top of what I was wearing. And I immediately mm. think about the heaviness, the weight of that. I mean, yes, the silk embroider, beautiful, delicate designs, you know, pretty pictures. But then I also think about you know, what does that mean? The dual beauty combination of that burden, heaviness, responsible as a as a woman for the society and the culture, and then the design of this beauty that we have to play both. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. That I, I'm glad that you actually pointed out the physical heaviness of this gown because it is truly heavy because it's made of a uh, multiple layers of silk fabric, and on top of it is uh, you know heavily. Uh, embellished with uh, embroidered uh, patterns in a thick silk, uh, uh, you know, thread. And but also when I see these uh, beautiful symbolic images, um, you know, uh, here that um, give me us, uh, you know, also I can relate it to this psychological heaviness, a great anxiety that the woman must have uh, failed during this uh, wedding, uh, wedding ceremony because. You know, these symbolic images are meant to uh, be really kind of uh, evoking the ideas of uh, having many children and uh, also having a you know harmonious marriage. But these are these uh, things are uh, quite difficult to accomplish in reality after being married. Uh, you know, uh, now and also uh, <laughs> having a child after thirty something hours of labor and experiencing two uh, traumatic uh, miscarriages. Now I'm ra uh, raising a uh, you know daughter, and these are things that kind of. Uh, came to a new meaning to me uh, as, as, as a, you know, uh, as a married woman now. So I feel really this, uh, uh, you know, going back to the psychological heavy, you know, physical heaviness and uh, really echoes the psychological heaviness of uh, many women's uh, experience uh, during the marriage and after the marriage. And actually, Maria, that makes, that brings me to a, to a question as like a sort of a final maybe reflection before we turn to some, you know, questions and comments, but um, how did you like navigate these very rigorous, you know, gender constructs like over the course of the project? Whether those are the ones that are prescribed by your cultural heritage, 
or the places where you find yourself, right? Wherever those might be. Um, like, did you find yourself, like, how did you, or did you find yourself breaking those, those sort of restrictive bounds that I think Swa and you are speaking of? Well, I'm all about breaking the mold. And if people resist what I'm doing, including my own family, and speaking of family, I want to also acknowledge if any of my family members are watching from the 50 states, please drop me a line. Hello. I want to know that you were part of this conversation because without your help, it would not have been possible. But challenges and breaking the mold is something that I always thrive on. It gets my creativity going. A lot of people, even today, before I joined our talk today, I had some interesting emails come my way saying, why are you doing this? And my simple answer will be, why not? You know, I get to, it gives me a chance and opportunity to learn from one another, you know, beyond the actual textbook. And look at the community involvement here in New York City, just because I'm looking at it. This is where I had my final 50th wedding celebration. And this is the rewarding that's, you know, the reward that I look forward to at the end, you know, and there, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. This is what I look forward to. And this is my home. So um, yeah, I like to challenge that and I'm going to continue to do that because I'm an artist. And maybe one final, um, maybe one final question before we do that, just a reminder to everybody, there's a link below. We'll, we'll show the movie poster uh, for the documentary, Maria the Korean Bride. Um, and uh, there's a link below that, um, you know, once you click on it, you should have access to the film one viewing only um, uh, per person. So I think it tracks your, you know, IP address or something like that. Uh, so please take a look. Uh, it's a great film. And um, Maria, uh, like, you know, this project ended, what's that? I, I just because I'm looking at a poster of my um, earlier work, Maria the Korean yeah. Bride, I have to say it may be your question next. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, what's, I, what's next? What's right, what next? Is next? <laughs> finally, finally, I just finished my sequel to Maria the Korean Bride Ghost Wedding, 3,000 year old tradition, life after death, including marriage matters in some Asian communities, including China, especially China, I should say. So, what mm -hmm. did I do? I actually tied the knot with a dead spirit in Taiwan. So, that movie, that documentary, maybe at a film wow. festival near you. So please stay tuned. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, I look forward to it. Um, and I'm going to ask the audience, please submit your questions into the chat. Um, I think, you know, some things are, are a lot of people are sending their love. Uh, Christine Marks, uh, uh, Ginta or Ginta, Gary Richmond yeah. says this brings back so many wonderful memories. Um, but please, people, populate the chat with questions. There's already one uh, that we've been given, I think, my, um, from Joanne Havala. Um, and I think maybe, Sua, you might be able to sort of reflect on this. Uh, Joanne says, I didn't know that men were the professional embroiderers. I'm curious what their education is. So uh, this male embroiderer, especially very active in this uh, city of Anju, is a Pyongan uh, province now belong to North Korea. And uh, because of that, the city is uh, really well known for the high quality of silk production. So it's, uh, it's naturally this uh, group of, uh, you know, embroiderers uh, became very active. But uh, what, what happened is this, uh, uh, by the end of the 19th century, there is a big demand for the uh, large scale folding Screen. So they needed more manpower, probably, and then these uh, these uh, male embroiderers were um, probably were educated by very experienced uh, female embroiderers, and they worked together. But it's uh, when they're selling their products, uh, probably uh, they really kind of use them uh, as a male embroiderer of this this city as a kind of brand name to selling this uh, large uh, scale folding screen. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to see this group of male embroiderer, particularly uh, from this city. Um, that's really interesting. The, um, the sort of the, the passing down of the knowledge from the women artisans to the male mm -hmm. artisans. 
That's really fascinating. This is a very peculiar one when you come to the, when you examine other Korean artworks, mm -hmm. like calligraphy, painting. This is the only one of the very few ones that women uh, played a role of a mentorship for the, you know, male, male artists, artists. Mm -hmm. Really fascinating. That's really interesting. Um, thank you for asking that question, Joanne, because it brought out an interesting point. Um, there's a question, it's more a comment from Nick, but I think it, it leads to a question I have. Nick says, please, please, please tell us you still have the Miller Bud Light polo shirt. Um, I'll be devastated without it, won't lie. But that makes me think of what do these, do you have like an archive of all of these like um, things that end up becoming part of your artistic practice? Do you see that as important? So I just think of like exhibitions, you know, as, as, a, as a person who works in a museum that collects things, right? I think of how performance art is documented, but also collected through sometimes the, the objects, right? Do you, is that important to you? Do you have these things? Well, to answer Nick's question, answer is yes, I keep them all. I'm not a hoarder, but I have all my collection that's been part of the wedding process. I save them, even some of the receipts, you know, gas money that I went to pump the gas. <laughs> I save those too if they don't fade away. So, I mean, those are part of the stories, right? That's what makes it. How much was the oil price then, back then in Oklahoma when I got married 2005 versus when I went to Chicago, it's different. So I keep them, all of them, as my souvenir and keepsake besides the wedding rings. And mm. then what was the second part of the um, question, Andrew? I think he said he'd just be devastated without it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Um, we have a question from uh, Christine, um, which is, how do you feel revisiting a project you started 20 years ago? Has your perspective on it or any aspect of it changed? A um, lot has changed. I look at the documentary now and I go, wow, I should have embraced those moments more. I should have kept it closer to my heart. But, you know, at the moment I was so over the top stressed out doing this alone, most of the states. Actually, Christine Mark, she went to um, Michigan with me. So I am, that was a luxury for me, for me to have another set of pair of eyes who could videotape and document and tell more interesting stories. So um, yeah, um, and then some parts are very painful because those of you who would have a chance to see the documentary later if you haven't done it yet, I end with a happy Cinderella ending with a man that I thought at the time that I loved, but we are no longer together. So. Yeah, so there is like painful moments, happy moments, loving moments, all of the above. Happens, but I also, right? I, I, I noticed, uh, uh, I noticed also about the things that we are right now talking about what we need to focusing on the community value of community also the you know the gender equality and uh, you know, race, uh, racial social justice. This is actually all Maria 20 years ago already uh, show in this project. It's just a very, you know, everlasting and universal value that we already uh, touched upon, you know, and then now became a very important issues now. And actually, uh, so while, while, while we're, oh yeah, while, we, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I do have a, maybe a quick question for you. It's actually the similar question that I had to Maria, like in your work, how do you find yourself navigating all of these sort of, uh, you know, gender constructs, right, in your curatorial work um, and your research. Um, I, I imagine the exhibition is an extension of it, but would you mind sharing while we're, you know, talking about experiences? Oh, so um, I grew up in South Korea and I finished my uh, college degree in South Korea. I work very briefly in, uh, in, in Korea in a museum field and, uh, and I quickly noticed that I, I cannot survive. <laughs> and uh, that I see the, you know, 
uh, really kind of male oriented culture. And now it has improved tremendously, but back then, uh, very much hierarchical and male oriented culture. And then I, I couldn't really express what I think or what I really hoping for that. So uh, that's kind of the motivation, the major motive that I left, uh, left Korea. Uh, and then uh, when I, you know, start working at the museum, uh, that you know, many East Asian uh, collections are uh, over, you know, that supervised by the you know Western curator who who study uh, that a study of area. And so, I mean, they are they are they are expert and everything, but it's 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 a kind of uh, it's for for me as an Asian American uh, working and a uh, Korean woman and uh, working in a Korean collection that I can actually feel. Um, I can bring more, uh, how to say, uh, uh, balanced, authentic perspective. Uh, that, that, you know. So that's kind of I feel I can make a more contribution to the field. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Lisa. I think for you, Maria, um, who she's really looking forward. They're looking really looking forward to the sequel. When can we see it? Do you have any, yeah, could you enlighten us or do you know yet? Well, I mean, the final editing's just got completed two weeks ago. It's been, um, okay. it's been yeah, it took me about two, three years to um, start to the end. We're working on a trailer right now. So as soon as the trailer's out, I'll upload it on my YouTube page, Maria the Korean Bride. So stay tuned or write to me. You can find me anywhere online. Yes, Maria, I know is very accessible, which is great. Um, Stephen H. asks, do you feel you have achieved your project goal? And what was the most unique enlightenment and as in quote, surprise? Yeah, I definitely achieved it. I mean, I don't have straight answer. What is, if you were to ask me, what is marriage? I, I cannot answer that because everyone's recipe works in different ways. Like what works for me may work not work for you. So, but I started the dialogue, I feel like, and that conversation, symbolic wedding, same gender, you know, same sex marriage, or it just, it goes much bigger than what I had anticipated. So I feel like in that perspective, hey, I got you thinking um, to, to maybe bring that up with your own immediate communities and family. And then I did my job. Um, surprises, how, my goodness, Americans are so nice. Um, they're so welcoming and these are the things we may have many many political differences and religious differences too but if you're honest with them face to face my gosh they will do anything to help you mm. and th th those are the surprises that i'm going to always treasure and walk away with that's why i mean sue you said it too community involvement and in mm. asian culture everything is communal you share the banchan food together with your chopstick mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of togetherness, not just on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. It's like that in Asian culture every day. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. So I think about that, and those are the surprises, Stephen, for me. Yeah, and that, those are that's a really nice um, uh, concept for us to sit with right now, with what's happening in, in the country. You know, wherever you might lie politically, I think we can all agree there's a lot of division and animosity. And um, I think it's a, a great thing to be reminded of that, that maybe on these individual levels, right? There's that experience. Um, Gary asks, Gary Richmond asks, Maria, how did you choose your final Times Square mate um, out of so many candidates? Or could you talk about that? Because some people on here might know, right? And some people might not. Um, if you care to share, whatever you care to share. Yeah, I mean, $5 raffle drink. Some people accuse me saying, oh, gold digger. And I'm thinking, gold digger? <laughs> no, $5 raffle drink. Let me tell you, I had to go through, I think, four picking, four winners just to get one. And um, yeah, but it was $5 raffle drawing. And it happened to be Rom, who happens to be another filmmaker based in New York City. And my groomsman, Bob Holman, who is a poet. So yeah. there you have it. And I think, if, you, if I'm correct, Gary, I think you were at my wedding in New York City. I don't know, Andrew, were you there? You know, I don't know if I was, I don't think I was. I don't know why I wasn't. I don't know why that, I maybe I had a tour at the, at the museum or something or teaching, who knows? I know Christine was there. 
Um, so I at least heard about it from her. Um, we have a great question from Yunjun Park, and maybe this will be the last one that we take so we can wrap up. Maria, it looks like that you still keep in touch with your grooms um, and the family from different states, which is wonderful. Do you have any follow-up meetings with them or celebrate anniversaries with them as part of your performance? Yeah, I mean, I wish I could still continue to celebrate with them in person. I follow them on Facebook and um, Instagram and other social media, but yeah, but not everyone's on social media. Like Span from Hawaii, no. <laughs> he would never use internet. He's busy surfing, let's just say. <laughs> so yeah, that's not the case. But um, who knows? I think about them often. Some people, I have to say, I've lost. Um, some people died. And um, yeah, so I think it's like cycle of life is what's, um, yeah, fascinating to me, especially now with the, you know, <laughs> with what's what's going on in the world. Yes, yeah, no, and, and I can speak from just in, to just help seeing Maria begin to sort of spread the word about this program. Uh, uh, young, how much people who are part of this and people who are probably seeing in the chat too are participating and who are there. And so it's kind of, um, you know, it seems like you do keep in touch, but maybe not in this more sort of okay. um, official way, if that makes sense. Right? Um, so I want to uh, thank both uh, both of you, right, uh, uh, Maria and Sua, for joining us this afternoon. It was a really great conversation. Uh, thanks. No, thank, thank you. you. Um, Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, right? Um, thank, thank, thanks to all of you out there for joining us. We apologize for some of the technical difficulties that you've experienced. There will be a recording. Uh, the recording wasn't interrupted, it's more of the stream. So um, if you wanna watch the full conversation, please, um, it will be up you know, shortly. Um, Desktop Dialogues has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, exploring the human endeavor. Um, and I just also wanted to, um, let everyone know about next week's uh, program uh, or program close looking at a distance called scrutinizing the stitches uh, which will be connected to this desktop dialogue i would like to invite um uh, my colleague kijo lee to say a few words about next week's program thanks so much andrew and thank you and maria and swa for that fascinating and really dynamic conversation uh, i want to inv invite the audience to join us and myself next week for Close Looking at a Distance, which is an interactive guided looking program where Swa and I will look closely at that glorious embroidered wedding gown and think more about what the stitching, the patching, and all of those uh, different features mean about the community uh, from where that uh, that wedding gown emerged. So we look forward to seeing you all next week, Wednesday, October 14th at noon. Great. Thank you so much, Kija. We look forward to it. Um, and there's even some questions about um, embroidery. So it looks like maybe, Joanne, maybe next week, Swa will be able to answer those. But if for those of you out there, if we didn't get your question during the program, or if you have more that come up later today, you can always go to Artlens Ask on the CMA website, and someone will get back to you with an answer. Uh, we have um, a link uh, we, just to, uh, for that. And um, um, and you can always explore more of the work in our collection. Um, visit CMA's collection online. So I want to thank you all uh, for coming and have a good afternoon. Take care. Bye.